Well, good, good evening, everyone. Um, I'll just uh, stop this slideshow and start the, the real one, and then I'll hand over to Laurie Jury, who will um, do the introductions and start the evening. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, so here we go. Uh, yeah, so, Laura, are you, are you ready to go? Uh, yep, yep. Sorry, I just um, trying to figure out my um, my camera. That's all right. Um, first of all, um, thanks everyone for for joining us. This is our first one of these um, cruising webinars. We've been doing a few of these, and Peter's been done a great job with our learn to sail. So, and we're actually going to look at running another learn to sail online course. We had about a hundred people sign up for the first uh, learn to sail online, and um, you know it was great. A great success and we've had of that I think we've had 20 or 30 Peter that have signed up to do the practical element to finish the learn to sale so fantastic, yeah, so um, fantastic. A few more. A few more, yeah it's great so if you've got anyone any of your friends or family that are interested in, interested in learning to sale um, sign up for our free online learn to sale course that's we're going to be running another one starting next week um, Pete runs those and um, and you do the Sorry, Larry, I can't hear you sign up afterwards for a, for a practical course at a reduced rate, uh, something to think about. But, um, and we've done a lot of these with um, about racing. This is our first one for cruising, so we'll see how it all goes. And we're very lucky tonight to be joined by John Tucker. How do we And um, if you don't know John Tucker, you, you might know, you probably know his daughter-in-law, Sarah Tucker, who worked at the Yacht Club for a long time. Um, and you might know his, his son, Josh, or one of his five sons, Josh Tucker, and um, and you know, um, very famous sailing family, very well known through New Zealand and Auckland, and he's done an extensive amount of cruising. I don't think there's anyone that's done as much cruising as him. Currently living on his boat up in Kerry Kerry, so he's going to give us a few um, a few pointers about where to go. And obviously, we've got Pete talking about um, some night navigation, and and Peter runs. Our level two and three courses, which which are cruising courses out to Cow Island and Great Barrier, and he's been running those for the last four years. And I think over those four years, he must have run forty plus courses out there, Peter. So he's got a fair few miles under his belt, and he's um, spent a fair bit of time cruising and and knows how to entertain and keep everyone happy on board. So definitely pointers. But before we start, we've got a message from our sponsor. So Daniel, uh, a new father for the second time, I hear. Yep, yep, I've got a two-day-old, so it's uh, hectic times at the moment. I bet. Well, thanks for, thanks for taking the time out to come and join us. Yeah. Um, thanks, Daniel's man. from PRC, obviously. Have you got a few a few words? Yeah, thanks Thanks for having me. I guess this is our first sort of full-time year of being involved with the um, cruising division. I think we jumped on right at the end of the bandwagon last year. Um, so this year we, we have a full crack of it, although... Um, COVID has kind of limited that a little bit this side of Christmas. Um, really looking forward to, to getting out there and seeing you all and uh, meeting you on the beach and other various places around the club and, and so on. Um, and if you have anything, if you ever need any, any of the insurance needs that need to talk to us, we do more than, than just boat insurance. Um, boat insurance is what we're, we're well known for, uh, but we do business, life insurance, domestic, personal, everything else. So more than happy to give you advice um, on any of those sort of insurance products um, and, and see where we can help you out. If we can't help you out, um, like I said, we're, we're more an advisory service. So give us a ring, um, have a chat to us, tell us what you need, um, and we can hopefully sort of sort you out. Cool. Anything else you guys want from me or any any specific, if you ever have any questions, honestly, feel free to, to give us a, a yell. Um, if you want anything from me tonight, um, I'll only be here shortly because I've got to go and put the little one down. But um, if anyone does have any insurance related questions, at the moment, the market's pretty, uh, insurance markets are pretty challenging in the boat insurance space, um, particularly for offshore cruises. If you're going to go offshore um, in the next you know, next May, probably best to start thinking about it this side of Christmas. Um, just a, just a, I guess a tip. 
Um, but if anyone's got anything, more than happy to answer questions or I can hand over and leave it to you guys. I've probably just got one question, Daniel. I, I, I paid my insurance premium, but I haven't received the, um, uh, what, what they I can't remember what it's called, you know, this insurance certificate. Maybe I'll give you a call about that tomorrow. Yeah, definitely do. So that'll be the certificate for the marina, is it? The marina's chasing it? Uh, no, it just I just really want to know the, the payments when received, that's all. But, um, right, okay. Yeah, give us give us a call or flick us a, an email and we can um, chase that up um, yeah. and get that to you straight away. But I, I, can, I can highly recommend PIC for insurance. So the um, storm that came through Auckland um, during lockdown, I got a very nice email from PIC just inquiring as to how everything was and whether I needed any assistance. assistance. And I went down and checked on the boat and it was fine. So I sent an email back. I didn't really expect to get a response, but I got a nicer email back saying, um, yeah, thanks for checking on the boat. It's great to hear that everything's okay. Um, the really nice personal service I, I find from PIC. Yeah. Cool. Thank you very much. Awesome to hear that someone's someone's getting good service from us. That's well, perfect. It was, it was really cool to get that email. Um, I was yeah. worried about the boat, and it was really nice to know that the insurance company was was also keen to know how everything was going and you know and was there if I needed. That was awesome. Yeah. I guess our, one of our big selling points is we work on behalf of, of the clients, not the insurers. Um, and I often tell a lot of people, you know, if insurance companies did a good job, I wouldn't, wouldn't have a job. Um, it's, it's, a, it's an interesting time out there at the moment with all the regulations coming in. Um, you know, regulations are generally brought in to try and protect the consumer. But unfortunately, a lot of these regulations are playing in the insurance company's favour. Um, so it's just, just something to be wary of. Um, and make sure you've got, yeah, good brokers to work with. That's the main thing. Yeah, it's been um, pretty difficult, I think, with claims. More in the Northern Hemisphere, isn't it, a few years ago? So it made the insurance side of things difficult. Yeah, in the marine market, there's been a massive collapse globally. Um, Lloyd's, a couple of years ago, reassessed their, their marine books on the back of some storms. Um, some things that happened over even as close as Australia with Hamilton Island taking a bit of belting. Um, and since then, there's been a, a bit of a, a shift away from, from hull insurance, boat insurance, um, and pleasure craft, as we call it in New Zealand. Oh, we'll, uh, listen, to, we'll listen to it on yours. <laughs> and from there, it's been, it's been quite difficult. To, uh, you know, you've seen Club Marine fall out of the market recently. Um, that's probably, you know, the most, most well-known thing uh, in New Zealand. But it's, it, it's actually global. It's happening right around the world. Yeah, well, well, my boat's 40 years old and I was really pleased that you guys were able to get some insurance on it because I, I understand that when boats are getting older that it, it can be difficult. Yeah, anything over at the moment, uh, there's a couple of insurance players out there, Vero, anything over 20 years, uh, NZI, anything over 30, they require full out of water inspections, which at the moment during lockdown is, is you know pretty much impossible to organise. Um, and there'll be a couple of months of catch up coming out of this um, people trying to get their boats out of the water, get them, get them ready for summer. Um, so it's pretty difficult. Anything over sort of 20, 25 years is quite hard to get insurance on. Um, so if you've got insurance in place, I'm not trying to trying to do myself a disservice here, but um, if you do have insurance in place currently, um, shopping around the market or looking at, at alternatives is not necessarily going to save you new money or anything else. It's probably just going to take up a lot of your time. Um, so at the moment, if you've got cover, um, we're, we're more than happy to talk to you. We're more than happy to, to give you advice. Um, but a lot of our advice will be to sort of stay where you are at the moment. Um, but that doesn't mean if you've, if you've got claims or, or an issue with a claim or some trouble on claims that we're not able to help. More than happy to, to, to field claims, claims calls, even if we, we didn't place the insurance, we can help you out. Um. I think we just had a question come through, Daniel. Um, yep. Yeah, so um, Mario's asking, can you give an overview of how to get boat insurance? Yeah, so I guess the, the easiest, it depends on the, on the type of vessel you have or type of boat you have. So if you've got, if you're, when you're first buying a boat, if it's a new purchase, definitely make sure you get an out of water inspection by either a surveyor or a qualified boat builder um, and get them to document it. 
Um, it'll make getting insurance a lot easier. If you've got an existing vessel, um, get in touch with us. Um, we can, we'll point you in the right direction and see what we can do to help. Um, anything under 20 years or uh, even under 30, if we look at NZI, relatively easy to get cover currently. Um, it just comes down to looking at the type of cover you want and the price. Um, there's a couple of different options out there between insurers, some agreed value, some are market value, all the different bells and whistles that they, they have, um, all the fine print that they'll try and catch you out with. Um, so those are the, I guess, the things that we'll discuss with, with each individual vessel owner um, as to what their requirements are, what they want to achieve with their insurance. But the, the easiest thing is to, to pick up the phone and give us a call. Um, even if the other, the other piece of advice is even if you've got an older vessel and, and it's come out of the water, um, if you've either got a, either keep a service history of everything you do. Um, so any work you get on board, um, most people do keep that. But, you know, every couple of years it's, it pays to get the boat resurveyed, even if you're um, not intending on selling her. Um, but just so that you can make sure you've got the, um, you can get cover easily. Yes, yeah, so Daniel, there's one more question come through. Yep. Uh, yeah, so Tony asked that um, a lot of insurers don't want to insure uh, people that live on board their boat. So yep. That's, that's, a, that's a, it's an interesting one. About every two or three years, that, that, that sort of changes in the market. So some years they love liverboards because of the security. Um, you know, there's a lot more security, and particularly marinas that allow liverboards because um, as soon as something's out, a missile or out of, out of whack, they, they seem, tend to pick it up really quick. Um, and then they go back to things um, worried about, like obviously if you're cooking a lot more on your vessel and you're in a marina, it's that third party liability if the fire spreads or anything like that, if there's a fire on board. Um, the biggest thing for liverboards is make sure you've got up to date gas certs, uh, electrical certs, everything like that. Um, and then have a look around the market. Uh, currently, uh, there's Vero will look at liverboards. There's a little bit of criteria they have around it, but they will look at it. And NZI, um, it seems to be what day of the week you ring them um, as to whether they'll look at it or not. So if, if you get knocked back and, and get the answer that you can't get insurance, it doesn't mean it's gone forever. It just means that you know the market at that current point in time um, isn't accommodating it. So... Um, Again, pick up the phone, give us a call. We'll, we'll, we'll have a look around the market, see where the market's currently sitting. Um, and if we can put you on some form on, on one of our sort of emails out, we can notify you if something does come available and the insurers are looking at it. And um, and just to, there is a discount for, for Yacht Squadron members, I believe, as well. Yeah, so 10%. So we take 10% off. Um, obviously, we don't set the premiums. The insurance companies set the premiums, but we take 10% off. We don't take... Um, any commission uh, or as much commission on, on any of the yacht, yacht club members, squadron members. And we, we should say with the PIC cruising series, it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a, one of our successful series. It's a five race series at a destination race throughout the summer. And obviously we're going to struggle a little bit this side of Christmas, but um, you know, looking forward to next summer. If you enter early, you do get a eco store pack. Um, which has got a whole bunch of goodies in it, plus some other stuff. So um, jump onto the squadron website and enter the, the cruising series and it's um, destination races to Waiheke and Kowal. And there's a, a free barbecue ashore with, um, with um, you know, provided free of charge um, beer and wine and sausages. Uh, it's a great, great series. We have about 20 boats doing that throughout the, throughout the summer. Uh, we are going to pro rata the entry fee. So if you, if you do pay our entry fee and it, um, the race ends up being cancelled, you will get a credit back onto your account. So don't be afraid of entering early for those series. Um, there was another question that just came through as well. Um, Daniel, insurance is a hot topic, I'm sure. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, there was a, is it, I've heard of there being uh, rigging stipulations with insurers. Do you know uh, anything about that? Yeah, again, it, it varies insurer to insurer. So um, Vero, uh, in the last sort of, sort of six to eight months, have started cracking down on, on rigging. Um, anything over 10 years old, they're requiring a survey. Um, it's actually been quite hard to get uh, rig inspections that are unbiased. 
Um, obviously, it's, it's pretty easy to contact Doyle's or um, anyone else that's doing rigging and, and get them up there to have a, have a good look at everything. Um, but yeah, Vero, Vero are the ones that work through brokers that have been um, sort of stipulating anything over 10 years. They require a full rigging survey. Um, and then obviously, if you're going to get a full survey, if you're getting a, a new boat, um, that's, that, that should cover that as well. Um, oh, great to know. Yep. Um, I should also say we've got Vicky Moore here. Um, I should check that you joined. Vicky, I think you're there. Um, I'm here. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Um, so Vicky's from the Island Cruising New Zealand. Is that right? Is that right? Yes, that's and right. Yep. And you're going to give us a bit of an introduction. Probably better you, you do the intro to yourself um, <laughs> of what the Island Cruising is. Thanks, Laurie. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming along and listening in tonight. So my name is Vicky Moore and I purchased Island Cruising earlier this year. It's a business that's been around for about um, 30 years and we are excited to be working with the squadron to help promote um, cruising and cruising to the Pacific and running events um, and helping people get ready to go cruising. So um, I had a chat with Laurie a couple of uh, weeks ago and we, we worked on sort of a pathway to cruising because we know a lot of people are um, interested in, in going sailing and not sure what the best way is of going about it. So obviously joining one of the squadrons learn to sail courses is a great way to get going and um, getting then getting some experience and um, either crewing for other people during races or cruising events is a great way to get some experience um, on the water and in a variety of different boats before you go off and then buy a boat and um, and we can help you with then getting your boat ready to go offshore. There's quite strict um, compliance with safety regulations and things like that for going cruising. Um, and we run regular cruising workshops to help people get their boats ready and also navigate your way through the, the safety regulations, which there's quite a bit to cover off. Um, so Island Cruising then organises various uh, events and rallies and things around the Pacific. We're also running one in New Zealand over this over the summer. We're heading down to the South Island and um, having a look around Marlborough Sounds, Banks Peninsula, and then down to Stewart Island and Fiordland before heading back up to the North Island again. And then some of the people that are joining that event are also heading up to the Pacific with us um, in the middle of next year. So um, I have, a, have I got some more slides there, Laurie? I can't remember what I sent through to you. I think I might have a... I think that was all you had, um, Vicky. That, that was all I put on the PowerPoint anyway. That, that was what I had come through, but... Okay, no, no problem. No worries at all. So I'll just elaborate a little bit more on some of the um, rallies that we've got coming up in our cruising preparation workshops. Um, so the workshops have started at the moment, they're all online, just to make things easier at the moment with um, not being able to get together on a regular basis. Um, so people can join at any time and take part in the workshops. And becoming a member of Island Cruising is just $75 a year to access these things. And um, we've got various things focusing on safety, um, passage planning, navigation, weather, and just generally getting yourself, um, your vessel and your crew all ready to go um, on a long coastal or an offshore voyage. Um, and then, as mentioned before, we've got our South Island Rally this summer. And next year, um, up to the Pacific, we run a Pacific Circuit Rally. And it hasn't happened for the last couple of years, obviously, with COVID lockdowns and things. But um, traditionally, the rally would leave from the North Island around May um, and head up to Tonga via Minerva Reef. And then um, spend a month or so cruising around Tonga before sailing across to Fiji. And we organise a special group check-in in Fiji um, so that you're able to get um, into the Lao group, which is otherwise um, not an open um, port for you to, to get into. So we fly some um, the immigration officials out to the Lao group to get people to um, check in there and enjoy sailing around that most beautiful part of Fiji um, and gradually make your, set your way to the west and taking advantage of the um, prevailing um, trade winds. 
Um, so after about six weeks in Fiji, we sailed then across to Vanuatu and spend another um, month cruising around Vanuatu. And once again, we organize a special um, group check-in there so that you can take advantage of those trade winds and not be um, spending too much time beating back up wind to cover off places that you had to sail past to get to the main check-in point. So, um, so that's the, the main um, benefit of that. And then um, we see head, head over to New Caledonia as our last stop and um, the, the next way to the best place to depart to come back to New Zealand just once again taking advantage of the weather systems um, departing from New Caledonia is a little easier to get home and, um, and they'll be back by October. So next year, the Pacific, we're still not sure about Tonga and Vanuatu being open, but Fiji and New Caledonia are looking like they're both going to be really good options. Um, and we are shortly going to be releasing some more information about the, um, those rallies and the plans that are coming up for next year. So hopefully if you're planning on going offshore, um, you're more than welcome to join us. We also look for crew members if you're wanting to do a, a league or two. Hopefully getting in and out of the country will be a little easier next year. And um, yeah, so hopefully you can join us. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Um, well, um, Vicky, Pete, Pete Linford here from the Yacht Squad. And I'm, I'm pretty keen to talk to you further because I've, I've um, been wanting to organise a flotilla for some of our Learn to Sail students to go and do some of the trips that you've mentioned. Yes. So maybe off camera, we should um, catch up, see how we can make that happen. Yeah, absolutely. Be very happy to happy to help, and um, yeah, we're just really keen to get as many people out on the water and go cruising, and just help people facilitate people getting offshore in any way we can. So um, yeah, very happy to help. Yeah. So I think we have got some questions coming through. So um, yeah, Tony's um, certainly keen to get involved. So I think with everybody, like if you want to talk to Daniel at PIC or more with Vicky, if you, if you flick me an email or, you know, just an email, uh, so plinford at rnzys.org.co.nz, um, sorry, getting a bit tongue-tied, but yeah, I'll, I'll flick on all of those um, contact details if you can't find them. Great, um, thank you. Okay. Um, right, so... I think this is my section, eh? So, um, yeah, there we go. So I'm just gonna go through really quickly because we've got a really great speaker coming up. Well, two speakers, John and Barbara, who actually live on their boat up in the Bay of Islands. And I'm, I'm pretty keen to get to their content. So I'm just gonna go through some um, coaching stuff, some of the stuff that we do from our level two and level three cruising courses. We're going to go through that really quick. Um, it's by no means a full navigation course, just a few pointers. Um, and then we'll get to um, well, Laurie's anchoring section. And, and then I think um, John and Barbara will talk about some of the cruising they've done over the last six years. So yeah, we'll have a look at some of the VHF channels that you can use while you're cruising. We we'll do a little bit on charts, not a full chart lesson by any means. We have a little bit of look at night navigation and how to identify vessels at night. And we'll go over some uh, rules as to avoid collisions. Um, so here are some of the channels that we can use around um, Auckland. Channel 16 is pretty much worldwide for emergencies. It should be left clear for emergencies, you know, not for chatting. Um, weather reports though, so live, now casting, um, you can pick that up on channel 19, so it's pretty useful, um, there's 20 and 79 there as well. So water sports events, they're on 17 and 77, so that's your club racing, here at the Yacht Squadron we use 17 most of the time, that's a low power channel, um, which is great for inner, the, inner harbour. For races that are a bit longer, you probably should be using channel 77 because that's that's a higher power channel. Um, now for trip reports, so if we're doing some cruising and we want to tell the Coast Guard where we're going, we can do that on channel 64 when we're leaving West Haven from the inner Haraki Gulf. But if you're out at Barrier then to do your trip report coming back, then you want to use the outer Haraki Gulf one, channel 60. Now. The full chart, which if you go to the Coast Guard uh, website, they've got this um, 
chart here, which shows you all of the channels that you can use for those um, trip reports. Pretty useful thing to download and, and have printed on the boat, easy at hand. Um, but yeah, and, and of course, ideally you should have a VHF course, which the Coast Guard run, and it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's like a couple of evenings. Um, and then of course you get your VHF license. If you're just using the VHF for emergencies, well, you don't need a license for that. So anybody can use channel 16 in an emergency. And of course this is New Zealand. So yes, there is a correct way of talking, um, a correct way of pronouncing all of the words and the numbers and things, but don't worry about that. This is New Zealand. You can just have a chat with the Coast Guard. They won't think badly of you if you're not using all the correct terms or whatever. Uh, anyway, yeah, so moving on. Um, oh, one of the other things is I really like the Coast Guard app. So as well as doing the trip reports and getting those um, weather reports from the VHF, you can also use the Coast Guard app. So you have to have an iTunes account or a, a you know, wherever other people get their um, apps from um, in New Zealand. So it needs to be based in New Zealand and then you can get the New Zealand Coast Guard app. So the first picture in the middle there, um, that shows the, um, the now casting. So here we can have a look at Bean Rock. And when I took that screenshot, it was eight knots or peak. That's uh, the gusts, it gives you the wind direction as well on the compass heading. And if I click this little icon up here, I can change that. So if I'm going up to Cowell, I can click that and have a look, see what the weather's doing in Tiri. So then I know what weather I'm sailing into. But also, if you trip, if you press down here, log a trip, you get this page opening up. And the really nice thing about using the app is that if you give it permission to, it will record your permission, your, your position. So if you give the trip report using a VHF radio, which is what we've done in the past, the Coast Guard doesn't launch the Westpac helicopter if you don't close the trip report. Um, they, have to, they wait for you to be reported as missing before they do that. Same deal with the Coast Guard app. They won't, if you don't close the trip, they won't suddenly start looking for you. But if you get reported missing, they know your location. If your phone stops transmitting your location, well, they know it's last recorded position and hopefully they'll start looking there. So I, th I think the app is um, a really good feature. And, and once all your boat details are in there, it remembers those details. So there's not very much to, to add. You know, you can do it quite quickly. Just where you're starting from, where you're going, how long do you think it's gonna take you, how many people are on board, and it's got your call sign and everything all stored in there. And you just send it a bit of a countdown. And uh, if you don't close it, then it will send a contact, a text message saying, hey, are these people okay? So it's a really good system. I strongly recommend that. It costs three or four dollars to get it, but it's a very worthwhile um, donation to the Coast Guard. And it's, it's a really cool app. Okay, let's move on. So port and starboard lateral marks. Um, here we've got a boat coming to the port. It wants to go through this. Um, there's actually two navigational channels and two reefs in there. And if that's all you can see as you're coming into that port, it can be quite daunting. Um, if we think about where our navigational lights are, though, it actually becomes quite easy. And all we need to do is line the green light up with the red, with the green triangle, because that's where one of the channels is. The other channel is through here. If you come, so you're entering the port with the green starboard side of your boat next to the port marker, well, you're gonna find yourself on a reef. Same deal for this one down here. Now that, should be quite familiar to anyone sailing in Auckland because that's the reef system around um, Bean Rock. So we've got Bean Rock in the middle, North Head, and over towards Mission Bay, there's another reef system there, Rangitoto on the top of the page. So all of our sailing instructions say that you should pass Bean Rock on the Rangitoto side 
and that's mainly because we don't want boats ending up on that reef system. Um, if you're leaving the port, then it, you will be leaving, so the port side of your boat are near the, is near the starboard mark, but coming in the green one to the starboard mark. So two things you need to know. You need to know port and starboard, but you also need to know whether you're entering or leaving a port, and there doesn't actually have to be a physical port there. You know, it could be that you're just entering a natural harbour. This is the way that the port and starboard lateral marks will be laid out. Um, if they're lit, then they'll have green flashing lights or red flashing lights, depending on whether they're port or starboard. All right, so let's so say I'm pretty keen to get to John and, and Barbara's uh, presentation. So I'm going to skip on really quick. If anyone's got any questions about any of this stuff, just flick me an email. Um, we, we go over this quite in detail on our level two and level three cruising courses. Um, and um, I'd be very pleased to help you out with any questions you've got. Um, cardinal marks. Oh, probably one thing I missed on the port and starboard lateral marks. If you're in the States, the colors are switched the other way. So during the World War of Independence, the Americans decided to mess with the English and switch the colors around. Um, that's not true at all. They didn't have car, um, port starboard lateral marks back then. But it's an interesting way of remembering that there's two voyage systems. So in New Zealand and in Europe and in most of Asia, Thanks, they have the same voyage systems what we have here, as I showed. In the States, in American sort of territories, um, then the, the, the shapes are the same. It's just the colours that are switched. They don't have cardinal marks in the States. They just have them here and in Europe, I think. Um, and these are really cool because they tell you exactly which way to turn. So if we see a post with two black triangles on it, that means keep north. So we're not going to turn to port or starboard. We're just going to look at our compass and turn towards the north because that's where the clear water is. There's rocks to the south, probably. East looks like a kind of egg shape. Same deal, we're just going to turn east. Now, sailors are pretty simple people. We don't want to make things too complicated. Keep south is the opposite of keep north. And it's simply two triangles pointing downwards. And west is the opposite of east. So west is two triangles still. But they kind of look like an egg timer. I think if you're a bit older, you might, I have heard Mae West, she's got an hourglass figure apparently. If you don't want to be too sexist, then you turn your head on the side, it kind of looks like a W. But however you want to remember it, that's cool. Um, but if you just remember keep north and keep east, then you can work the others out. They're just the opposite. Um, they do have colours on the sticks as well. So the triangles are getting smaller um, and the sticks are becoming more important. So keep north is black, yellow. Keep east is black, yellow, black. Keep, keep south, I'm, I'm sure you already know that. It's just the opposite of north, so yellow, black. And keep west, opposite of east, yellow, black, yellow. Now, black triangles at night are pretty useless. Um, you can sometimes see the yellow paint though, but these cardinal marks are lit sometimes. They're lit with a white light and keep east is three o'clock on a clock face and it flashes three times. Keep south, six o'clock, flashes six times, but then there's a long flash. And that's just to distinguish it from nine o'clock, which is keep west. And then keep north, well, no one can be bothered to count to 12, that's just continuous flashing. So, looks complicated, looks like there's a lot of information there, but if you break it down, it's quite straightforward, really. The arrows kind of point to the way you've got to go if you go if, if it's keep north. Keep east looks like an egg. South and west are just the opposite. And then you've got this flashing sequence. Um, so if you see a white light that flashes three times, 
is a key base cardinal mark. And that's the only, um, you know, there won't be anything out, else out there that has that flashing sequence. Um, okay, let's, let's move on. So vessel identification at night, obviously, it's a significantly higher. I, I love sailing at night. It's a really beautiful thing to do with the stars and sunsets, bioluminescent plankton. It's all just awesome. But other vessels out there are pretty hard to spot. If you see a green and a red light, well, that's a sailing vessel and it's heading straight towards you. If there's a white light, well, that's a power boat. It could be a sailing boat that's motoring, but technically a sailboat that's motoring is classed as a power boat at that point. So these lights, if you break them down, you can build up a kind of story behind it. So what can we see here? We've got a green light, so it's the starboard side. We've got a white light, so it's the starboard side of a power boat. And it's because we know it's the starboard side, we know it's going from left to right. Looks like the same thing, but this power boat has an additional light. And this is an important boat to recognize um, because if there's a white and a red, well, that's a pilot vessel and it's on duty. And the reason why we want to identify these boats is because generally they're only out if there's a big ship entering or leaving the port. Now, the way I remember this is that being the, you know, the driver of a pilot vessel, the skipper, that's obviously someone that's really um, very experienced. So they've probably got gray hair and they've probably got a red face because they're mad at all the sailors not knowing the rules. But yeah, so white over red, gray hair over a red face, that's the pilot master, and he's guiding a big ship into the port or out of the port, probably. Identifying that and then keeping an eagle eye out for that big ship is a um, pretty useful idea. The big ships can travel quite fast. Um, okay. So here we go, there's the red light. So that's a port side, power driven vessel again, because it's white at the top there. Um, so heading from right to left this time. We've got some additional red lights here. Now, as a rule of thumb, the more lights a boat has, the further away from it you should be. This one in particular, is a vessel that's restricted in its maneuverability. So I'd want to be a long way away from that if they're not in control of where they're going. Um, yeah, so red, white, red, vessel restricted in maneuverability, sailing boats need to give way to that. Um, this boat, we see that quite a lot in Auckland. Let's go through what we've got. So we've got a, a white oh, light, you, power boat. We've got a red light, so it's the port side. So it's going from right to left. And it's got a flashing yellow light. Well, I'm sure everybody in Auckland recognize that as a ferry. Um, the flashing yellow light means that that boat can travel at above the speed limit. So they might not be doing 12 knots, they might be doing 25 knots. Um, and they are allowed to do that because they're a, a low wake vessel. So most of the speed restrictions are down to erosion and well, just being polite to other boat users really. But if you don't create a lot of wake and, you, and you're a ferry, then you can break the speed limit. So port side of a power driven boat, we've got two lights now, two white ones. This is another one to um, identify quite early because there's a vessel engaged in towing. This in particular is a short tow. So the barge that it's towing or the boat that it's towing is fairly close, so about 200 meters maybe. Uh, if we see three white lights, well, that's on a long tow and that could be two nautical miles long. So they tend to um, shorten and extend the tow line depending on the sea state and you know uh, 
how, how, how they're feeling their vessel is and their manoeuvrability. Um, if you're on a long tow, though, that barge might not be directly to behind, depending on the wind and the tide. They might have a lot of leeway on the barge. Um, from viewed from the stern, that will have a yellow stern light. So it's not flashing, it's just on all the time, it's a stern light. And if you see that, you're probably between the tug and the barge. And the way to deal with that is to turn your vessel towards that yellow light, keep turning and sail away from it. If you turn the other way, well, you could be turning into the barge and into that, that tow rope. The, well, the tow rope is, is not a tow rope, it's a cable, it's probably as thick as your arm and it will do a lot of damage to your boat if you, if you hit it. So, Good thing to um, recognize that. Um, right, so single white lights, well, could be an anchor light. Small boats rowing, they could just have a torch. Small sailing boat as well, less than seven meters, they only need one white light. But if it's up high, it's probably an, uh, an anchor light. If you're a very big ship, you need two anchor lights, one on the bow and one on the stern. Um, okay, so we're flicking on real fast now and we're just looking at the give way rules. And if you notice on this boat, on the left hand side of the screen, if you're driving this and you look across to the other boat, you'll see a red light. And if you're on this boat and you look across to the other, you'll see a green light. Well, it's just like traffic lights. So this boat is the stand on, on the right hand side. And this boat is the give way vessel. So don't get too stressed when you come across a green light. You should be able to carry on. But if you're coming across a red light, well, you're probably gonna be the give way vessel and Oh, I skipped on a bit too far there. So, and power doesn't always give way to sail. So there's another slide coming up, which will explain that. I know most sailors think power boats give way to sail boats, but it's not always the case. It's not a blanket rule. Um, yeah, but basic give way rules there. If you're viewing another boat and you're seeing a port side, then you've got to give way, you're on stop. If you're viewing, the starboard side of the boat, you get a green light, you're the stand on vessel. Okay. So, um, big ships. This is the navigational channel around North Head. And these big container ships that come into Auckland, uh, we haven't seen any cruise ships for a while, but I'm sure they'll come at some point. They have to stay in this channel. That's a dredge channel that's deep enough for them and they have to stay in there. And they have priority in there. And we need to stay 500 meters off the bow and 200 meters off the side and the stern. And simply if we get closer than that, they can't see us. They can't stop. You know, if they go full reverse, that's probably gonna take them a mile or so to stop. And they're not that maneuverable and they're restricted to that channel. So if we're in this channel, that's fine if no one's around, but if there's big vessels in there, um, they will be a bit grumpy and you'll probably hear five blasts on their horn, which will be, that means what, what are your intentions? And it kind of means what the hell are you doing? Get out of the way. Cause like you're going to die if you don't get out of the way, cause they will run over a sailboat and not even notice. Um, so it's worth keeping clear of them. And even if our race course goes through, if we're racing, that's not an excuse to get in the way of one of those. The, the racing rules only applies to boats that are racing. Maritime law applies to everything that's happening on the water. Um, yeah, we should stay on the starboard side if we can. Obviously with sailing, we're not necessarily always going to be able to do that. And going back to the power boat, um, gives way to sailboat. It depends on the maneuverability of the vessel. So if you're towing, if you're restricted in your maneuverability, if you're very large, well, you're probably not as maneuverable as a sailing boat. Usually power boats are more maneuverable, which is why most of the time they have to give way. 
You know, they don't need so much water. They haven't got a keel sticking out the bottom of their boat. They don't need to think about the wind direction. So usually power boats are more maneuverable than a sailing boat. But when you're very big or there's a problem on the boat and you're restricted in your maneuverability, or if you're towing a barge and you've got this massive vessel which is difficult to control, then sadly sailing boats, you do need to keep clear of that stuff. Um, okay, let's um, move on. So yes, yeah, so we're gonna have a little look at, at charts very quickly. Um, we'll see the white area of the chart and they've got some big numbers in there, 26. And as we go into the light blue, they get a bit smaller and the darker blue, those numbers are smaller still. Well, they're the depths of the water. So, and it's at CD, which is chart datum. And that's basically the, the lowest tide that we're likely to expect. So on a spring low, we're likely to have um, 26.5 meters in that location down there. Um, cables, so we can see cables on the chart. So up here, going on to the, the point here, just by Mansion House, there's a cable. Cables are wiggly red lines. This one is a power cable, because it's got that bolt of lightning there. And we don't want to anchor anywhere near that. Um, there's some big fines if you damage the cables, if we anchor near them. Going across Bonacord Harbour, we've got some cables as well. These are telecommunications cables. See, it's got a little, little T within the wiggly line. Other things we can see on the charts are some shipwrecks. So seems to be quite a lot of shipwrecks. WK is shipwreck. Um, so if anyone's interested in diving, I don't know what you can see up there. I've never done it, but um, there's a lot of interesting stuff you can see on, on, on charts. This M here is pretty useful. It looks like it's part of the shipwreck, but that actually means that the nature of the bottom of that part of Bonacourt Harbour is mud. And that will help you with your anchor selection. Mud is really good holding. So this harbour, because it's quite a long harbour, because there's mud at the bottom, it's a really good place to go in a storm. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out on this chart is Martello Rock here. So Martello Rock is a sector light and it's really useful for navigating your way to Kowal. We'll see here that it flashes three times, white or red. That th those three flashes plus a bit of a pause happens within a 15 second period. It's eight meters off the um, sea level. And if we see the white light, we can see that for eight miles. And if we see the red light, we can see that for six miles. So this code, basically that little purple teardrop is a lighthouse or a navigational aid. And this code tells you the flashing sequence. If you use Navionics, it has the flashing sequence and words describing that flashing sequence. Um, but the white or red is quite interesting. So this circle that goes around Martello Rock shows you the sectors. So this is a white sector. Then from here all the way down is a red sector. There's R there. This white sector here shines all the way through the reef system. So we've got Moda Kedi Kedi here. And there's a reef that come off Moda Kedi Kedi with a Keep East Cardinal mark on the end. That's not lit. So it doesn't flash three times. Um, but the point of Martello Rock is to guide you through that reef system. Because we don't want to hit this reef. We don't want to hit the reef system around the beehive. So if we're approaching from Tiri and we see Martello rock, rock flashing as a white light, flashing three times, that means we're in the, the channel and we can proceed straight towards Martello rock following that white light. If we're off course a little bit, we'll see Martello rock flash as a red light and that means we're going to hit 
that reef at um, the beehive, or we're going to hit the reef off Motokiri Kiri. So it doesn't flash white and then red. Depending on your angle of approach, you're either going to find yourself in the white sector, which if you do, that's great. You can proceed and you're clear of the um, reefs. If you see it as red, well, you need to have a think about your position because you shouldn't proceed. You're going to hit the reef if you, if you carry on. Now, as we proceed closer, you see that it gets a bit shallow around in that area. So as the um, white sector takes you through past the Beehive Island, there's 5.6 metres of water there. And just over to the left, we've got the Albert Shoal, which is just 3.7 metres deep. So depending on your depth of your boat, you might want to proceed and follow the white sector. Um, if you're a bit worried about the Albert Shoal, and I think if you're on a race boat with a three metre long keel, then that's probably good to go around the Albert Shoal. Um, I think if you're, you know, if you're two metre keel, then you're probably not going to worry about the Albert Shoal too much, particularly if you actually are following the white sector. Um, but I know, you know, big sea, if you're at the bottom of a wave, then yeah, if you've got a long keel, the Albert Shoal could do some damage. So it's probably worth avoiding. All right, so I think we can move there. All right, so yeah, so I just go over some flashing sequences and then I think we've got um, Laurie's anchoring coming up. So Bean Rock flashes three times. It's, it's a keep East Cardinal mark. Um, it flashes white or red. And if you go on the western side of Bean Rock, well, you're into that reef system between Bean Rock and um, Mission Bay. So much better to stay east of Bean Rock and pass on that Rangitoto side. So FL means it's flashing. Three means there's three flashes, and it's going to be white or red, depending on the way you approach the mark. Uh, Tiri uh, flashes 15 or 15S, 91M, 18M. So a little bit different to the others. So FL means flashing. It doesn't say how many flashes. And if it doesn't say, well, it's one flash, and one flash happens every 15 seconds, it doesn't give a colour. So then the colour is white. That's kind of like the default. It's 91 metres high. So Tiri is a really high island and then there's a wooden structure on top. Tiri is a beautiful island to go. It's a bird sanctuary and the walk up to the um, lighthouse on top is, is really good. Um, so 91 metres high. And if you can see it, you're within 18 nautical miles of it. So all of this information, there's a lot of information within that code. It's pretty easy to decipher it once you know how. It's not rocket science. You just got to break it down, a bit like those um, vessel identification lights, you know. It, it, it looks complicated, but if you break it down to what you can see, then you can figure it out. Um, Moda Kitty Kitty. So FL, white, red, 10S, 21M, 8 bar, 5M. So I'm sure some of you are picking that up already. So one flash every 10 seconds. You can see the white light for eight nautical miles. You can see the red light for five nautical miles. If you're approaching from Tiri, you'll see the white light and you can aim straight at that from Tiri. And then if, as you're going up to Cowell, Martello Rock will just be on the right hand side of that as you get a bit closer. And you should be straight in that white sector at that point. So yeah, Martello Rock, FL3, and there's that. So sector light, we want to see the white light because we're in the channel then and we're going to miss those reefs. Um, if you see it red, well, I'd stop and just have a think about where you are. Um, you could triangulate your position from there. Um, we go over that on our level three course. Um, that goes out to barrier. Level two, we, we keep it quite, um, kind of build on the knowledge basically. So we cover all the basic stuff in our level two cruising courses that go out to Kowal. Um, we do that on a Tuesday evening. And then we'll, um, 
on the level three course that goes up to um, uh, barrier, then we go much deeper into the um, reading paper charts and navigating using paper charts. It's an interesting skill to have, really good skill to have because, yep, we're going to use Navionics and a chart plotter when we're sailing. It's just more convenient. But if we've got an emergency, well, we're probably going to lose power. You know, if the battery goes flat, then we need to know how to sort that out. So reading paper charts is a really useful skill to have. And it's not that hard. It looks difficult because there's a lot of information on the chart, but a few hours of instruction and it, and it can all be demystified. I've gone through things really fast um, this evening, deliberately because I want to get to John and Barbara's presentation. Um, and uh, if, you, if you'd like to know more, flick me an email and I'll arrange a session for everyone to go into that a bit deeper. All right. So, um, Laurie, uh, are you ready for your presentation on anchoring? Yep, yep. And um, like Peter, you know, um, I don't want to teach everyone here to um, suck eggs. I'm sure everyone's very familiar with anchoring. And um, we do want to move on to John and, and Barbara. So um, I'll just flip through this real quick and make sure you ask any questions because um, otherwise we'll just keep, carry on. Um, I mean, there's the types of anchor here. So, and this, I guess there's the four main types there. There's the CQR, Plough, Delta, Rockner, um, and there's sort of all the very good big round, um, you know, the good all rounders. Um, the Bruce and the, the Bruce or the Claw anchor, and then the Danforth. And, you know, we could you could talk about the two different types of anchors and the different types of um, holding and different types of um, seabeds for ages. Uh, we're not going to do that. I'd say most boats would have the sort of that CQR, Plough, Delta, Rockner or, or Bruce. The Danforth we use for, um, for all our marks just because it's lighter and cheaper if you break it really. Um, but it does have really good holding in the mud. Um, important to get the right size for your boat and it's just a compromise between um, the weight of it and having to pull it up or have your anchor winch pull it up and, um, and if it's too light you'll drag. So it's, it's finding that right compromise. We'll just move. So uh, as well as the anchor, um, really important is the tackle. So you've got to have enough um, enough chain and the, the size has got to be big enough on the squadron vessels. We use eight mil, um, you know, that's for a 12 meter vessel. Yeah, anything bigger, you want to obviously go bigger. If it's, you wouldn't really go under eight mil even for a smaller boat. Um, you need at least really the length of the boat and chain. And if you've got an anchor winch, most boats will just have full chain. And you, you need a lot of chain if you're all chain, if you want to anchor anywhere. Uh, for example, the squadron vessel Takuma will be anchor in the middle of the channel and not the ideal place to anchor with, um, you know, two knots of tide and, you know, up to 30 knots of wind. But, um, you know, we, we use a full 60 metres of chain sometimes to anchor to try and hold in, in that position. So um, have enough chain there. The more chain you let out, the, the better your holding is going to be. Um, an anchor buddy is is something you can do to sort of supplement if you don't have enough chain. Um, you can put like a, it's a, you can buy an anchor buddy, which is a lead weight, which you put down the, down the anchor line. It sort of helps you hold and helps you swing less. Um, you can just, you know, often I've just used dive, dive weights or um, whatever you've got that's heavy and just drop it down the anchor line with another rope attached and to, to help you um, hold a bit better. Uh, three to one minimum. And I, I think everywhere you read, they always say five to one. And any hardcore cruiser is always going to tell you five to one. But if you if you're if you ever go on cruising at Waiheke, that's just not possible at times. Um, you'd be swinging into boats left, right, and centre. So I mean, if you've got a decent anchor and you're all chain, um, and you're anchoring in a crowded anchorage, you'll you'll be fine with a three to one anchor, um, three to one scope. So that's that's the distance from the bottom to your where you're where your anchor comes off your boat, you got to remember that. And then times it by three, and that's how much, at least how much you should have out. And the more, the better. The compromise is if you let out too much, um, you're going to swing around a lot. And um, if there's a lot of boats, you're going to be crashing into boats. Um, one, one other thing with that is check your tide times as well. Because if you, if you anchor at low tide on a three to one ratio and the tide comes in, you're going to be, um, you're likely to drag, obviously. 
just um, check your tide times and anchor. Put enough warp out for for high tide. Um, and then if, also if you anchor somewhere at, at a high tide, make sure there's enough depth for you at low tide. Um, choosing your spot, offshore wind, okay. Um, it all seems pretty obvious, no swell. Protected from as many directions as possible. Um, protected from any expected weather change. You know, you've got to make sure you're looking at the forecast, especially overnight. How busy is it? Um, how much space? Um, you often find that, um, you know, there'll be three boats anchored in a bay and then everyone thinks that's a good anchorage. So there's all of a sudden a lot of boats in that bay. Um, the, the issue with that is that you're going to struggle because you're not going to be able to put enough warp out or enough scope out. So just because there's a bunch of boats in a bay doesn't necessarily mean it's the best place to anchor. And you're going to be reduced holding in that you can't get as much scope out as you as you would like because you're going to swing into other boats. So just um, something to think about as well. Don't just follow the herd as much. Um, you know, any rocks, the type of bottom and the holding it's got. And as Peter said, you can see some of that on the chart or you can read the cruising guides, which Don will talk about a little bit further on, which will give you a bit more detail. The depth, ideally, the shallower, the better. Obviously, without hitting the bottom, it's going to be better for your scope and for your holding. Um, if you're lucky, if you're if you're on a catamaran or a multi hull, you can anchor in very shallow water. It's, you're going to hold very well. Um, and check the up-to-date chart for cables and or anchoring restrictions. That's the last thing you want to do is be pulling out the cable. Um, so then it's Waiheke. You can see how busy it is there. Um, and, you know, it's just about picking your spot um, and, and getting in relatively early if you know it's going to be a busy anchorage. The, the etiquette, etiquette is if, if you anchor first and you swing into someone that anchors after you, they should move. It's not always that, but that's what it should be. Um, if you if you if you go out and you put out five to one scope and you're swinging into a lot of people, maybe you can pull up a little bit of scope. So it's just some key tips and remember to fire through your questions. Um, yeah, from, this is just thinking off the top of my head is um, find your gap. Um, and when I'm, we're talking about that is, is I'm really thinking about anything at Waikiki and Labor Weekend, you know, and it's 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 packed. There's a lot of boats there, and it's actually hard to find your spot. So the bigger the spot you can find, the better. Um, it's a team effort. It takes two people to anchor. Um, you know, you need someone up in the bow, or normally you have two people. So it, the key thing here is, and I think where people come to um, gr grief is that you want to sit down before while you're motoring in there. You want to sit down with whoever's going in the bow and find the gap together and identify what, where you want to anchor. You don't want to be doing that with someone on the bow and someone at the back of the boat screaming at each other. It's, it's not um, inducive to a, a nice weekend away. So um, have, a, have a think about where you want to anchor. Talk to each other while you're in the cockpit. Get all planned for it and then, then get someone go to the bow. Um, if it's a busy anchorage, the key is really to go, um, you know, all the boats are hanging into the wind. Um, go right up to the stern of another boat and go pretty close, you know, within a boat length. If you drop it off the a boat and off the stern of another boat, you might look at your funny or when you're dropping your anchor. But um, the reality is you're going to obviously that's where your anchor is. The boat's going to end up quite far back from that. If you um, go to and what you see often is um, people go to find the best spot, they go right to where they want the boat to be, and then start dropping the anchor, and then they end up dropping back on top of another boat. It all seems very straightforward, but um, you just got to think about it a little bit. So you should be find the place you want to anchor, and then motor up to the stern of another boat obviously they're hanging into the breeze and drop it off their stern um, and then you'll drop back pretty quickly and if you you know it's easier to let more more rope out um, have your hand signals ready so you know you don't really want to be yelling at the person on the bow so make sure you got your hand signals for down and up and stop and hold and um, everyone knows what you're talking about make sure the boat stop before you're dropping anchor so you see a lot of people dropping the anchor while motoring forwards and you sort of cringe, there's a high chance that you can wrap your chain around your anchor if you're doing that and then you're going to be having another crack at it. Um, if you're drifting, you, ne you need to be drifting backwards while you're letting the chain out to avoid wrapping the anchor. So you can't drop everything on top of it, on top of it in a big pile on the bottom. It's um, likely to get tangled. And then um, once you've got the the anchor sort of where you want to be, you got to have to dig it in with the engine a little bit. Um, one thing that, that I do is yeah, I give, give it quite a bit in reverse and then put it back into neutral and the boat should 
you know, get some momentum backwards and the anchor will dig in and stop the boat. But you don't you don't want to keep it in reverse against the anchor because you'll just drag the anchor out, back out again. To retrieve the anchor, drive up on the anchor. Don't just grind it up on the anchor winch. Um, this is especially important, you know, if it's, you know, for us, we anchor our pole boats in places you shouldn't anchor, like in the middle of the channel in strong breezes, you know, or out in the middle of um, Cowell Bay when you're finishing a race. And if it's, um, if it's really dug in hard and you just press the button on the anchor winch, you're going to block the anchor winch. We've blown up a few on our patrol boats and... Um, what we really need is, um, is yeah, what you really need to do is you need to drive up on it and you need someone on the bow pointing to where the anchor anchor is. And if it's not coming out, if the, you can hear the, the winch starting to really grind, just stop, stop um, pressing the button on the winch and drive over it on the boat and that'll pull it out. Um, if it won't come out, you're going to have to put a tight fender to it and, and go back and pick up some dive gear. So a couple of other, other ways is uh, rafting up. Um, sorry. Is um, rafting up. Not every boat needs to have an anchor out. So, you know, if you just got one boat rafting up next to you, obviously the bigger boat should have the anchor, ideally. And um, you can just raft up and tie up next to them and, and tie up as if you tie up the dock with. Make sure you, you've got your spring lines, um, you know, and your bow and your stand lines all, all attached properly. Um, if once it gets more boats than two, you know, if you're three, four, five boats and you've got a lot of anchors out, there's a high possibility of tang tangling your anchors. So just be ready for that. Um, have a have a fender with a bit of rope ready to go in case you're going to drop your anchor off. Make sure the end's, you know, easy to untie or easy to cut so you can um, let your anchor go with a float attached if you have to, especially if you're, if you're rafting up like that overnight. And spring lines are key, you know, there's going to be a lot of bumping around, big fenders and lots of spring lines. Uh, stern 2 is um, is another way of anchoring, you know, and it's it's great over at the barrier. A lot of people do it in Europe, in the docks over there. It's how they got all the boats um, anchoring to the marinas. But, um, you know, over the barrier in Fitzroy, it's a, it's a perfect place for it. It's a very deep harbour over there, you know, a couple of metres off the shore. It can be you know, 10 metres deep, 10 metres plus. It's really hard to... Um, hard if you don't have an anchor winch um, but it's um, you know it's great for stern too so the way to do that is to um, have your stern line ready first send someone ashore on the dinghy to tie it on and the trick is to double it around something so if you're putting it around a tree or something or a rock try and loop it back so that you can have both ends on the boat so you can let it go quickly or at, at least tie a, a big bow line so that you can reach it um, pretty easily without having to go ashore um, and then you drop your anchor out and reverse into the wind and um, meet the dinghy, attach a shoreline and then adjust it to sit how far off the shore you're comfortable with, really. Um, you have to be make sure that the wind's the right direction, so it's got to be an offshore breeze, obviously. Um, so there's a raft up, I think that was Barrier, probably 10 years ago. Um, and we've, we've had a lot of these and um, there was a fair amount of carnage at times when um, when the wind shifted at night. So you want to be prepared for that. Um, and just, you know, if you, if you don't have an anchor out, it's pretty easy. Just untie and go. If you do have an anchor out, you, you could have some issues. Any questions? That's a picture there of, of a stern line. It's the best picture I could find <laughs> in the day. But uh, yeah, running something to shore like that, you can pull yourself back in. And you can see how deep it is there just off the shore. So a really nice way to anchor. Um, it fits for a New Year's. Often it's it's packed, it's crowded. And if you uh, you can sort of tuck into a bay somewhere and stern into there and you're not going to swing around at all. You don't have to worry about hitting other boats. And and with with uh, Fitzroy Barrier, it is so deep that there's a lot of swing. People swing around a lot. And there's some big boats out there. So that is a great way to anchor in, in, um, in the busy anchorage. I think this is the last slide, but um, when it goes bad, um, uh, you know, it happened to me, it's happened to me a fair few times. Um, probably trying to anchor race boats is not ideal. You always have the smallest anchor possible to save weight, which is not really designed for anchoring. But if you are dragging, the first thing you do is let up more scope um, as much as you've got. Um, you may have to reset the anchor if the anchor's tangled. Um, if you're still dragging, you may just need to find a new spot, obviously. Shallower the water, the better. Put more weight, anything you can find, you can put on the chain to, to help it down. 
uh, more scope into the anchors. So I've just shuffled the anchors onto each other in a line before um, with two anchors, and it's worked fine to, to hold us in, um, you know, in 30 plus knot breeze. Um, and then if you can't get your anchor up or it's tangled with other boats, um, you, and you've got to be ready for this because, you know, this is going to happen in a panic. So you've got to know what you're doing. And the last thing you want to do is drop your anchor without anything tied onto it. So, you know, you've got to get a fender tied to the to the chain. And the line, and you've got to remember the length of the fender. If it's all chain, you know, if you've got yeah. three metres of chain, it's going to sink the fender. So tie a 20, 10 metre length of line to the fender, tie it to the chain, chuck it over the side. You can get out of there. You can come back and pick up the fender, um, whether that's in your dinghy or, or later. At least you, you can retrieve your anchor. Hopefully you got a spear on board to anchor that night. So that's me done. So we'll pass over to John and Barb and Barbara to um, talk about Bay of Islands. Yeah, so so John, you might just need to turn your camera and your microphone back on. Yep, okay. We're... Okay. All right, uh, we're in now. Okay. Awesome, yeah. So if you've got multiple devices on where you are, if you if you mute one and turn the microphone off on that one, then we won't get all the feedback coming through. But yeah, um, thanks very much, John. I'm I'm really looking forward to this. So um, yeah, let's just get into um, um, John and Barbara um, Tucker's cruising. Okay, um, I'm hoping you can hear us. Um, yeah. Right, yep. the, um, the Bay of Islands is a pretty um, major area. We're just showing you here a, a very small part of it, and you can see from all the pink um, the pink spots just, just how many anchorages you can go to, depending on the weather, of course. But uh, we'll, we'll really look here at, uh, at how you, you find your way to the Bay of Islands um, from Kawa Island. Um, um, could you move on? All right, okay. So we've just broken down here the distance between them. Um, to get from Kawao, uh, hop up to, to Whangarei Heads, you've got 36 miles. So if you've got a boat that's cruising at, say, six knots, you're talking about six hours. It's not a big hop. Um, anybody who's done the Coastal Classic will know that you can do the whole lot, really, with not much, too much overnighting. But the problem with overnighting on a cruising boat is you've got to worry about, about um, pilots with white hair and red faces and um, lots of green and, and uh, red lights and flashings and all the rest. So if you just want to relax and have a, a cruisy trip up there in good weather, then you can, you can pick your hops. So uh, if, we, if we look at the, at the 36 mile hop up to Whangarei Heads at least, uh, you can do that very comfortably in about six hours before the kids start playing up. And uh, before you want to, to, to settle down for a, a glass of wine or a, or a beer or two, um, you can hop inside the heads for, um, for a night if you wish. So if we go to the next slide, we'll see what we've got inside Whangarei. Right, of course, you pick your good weather, as you, as you can see there. Right, now Whangarei heads, uh, there's, it's very well marked. It really is an excellent channel in. Um, you'll, you'll have it on the chart or on, on your plotter. You'll see quite clearly uh, where the, the bad bits are. You, you really got to watch out for those green bits because they dry right out. But um, it's, it's worthwhile hopping into Whangarei Heads if the, if the weather's packing up or, or if you need any supplies or whatever else. Um, you can see it's, it's actually a big harbour. It takes about two and a half hours to get from the heads right up to the town basin. So we're talking about substantial distance with quite strong currents. Um, and a channel to follow. Uh, we've broken it down into two parts. So if we look at the next slide, um, if you just decide you want to hop in there for the night, you can go into Urquitz or Kelly, uh, that area, or possibly up to the top left there, up into McLeod's, which is it's also a very nice spot. And you're only really talking about an hour out of your way from the main, um, from, from being out at sea. Um, can be very comfortable. It's in, if the weather's packing up, you can hop in there for a night or two. If you need supplies, you can do it too. If you want to go any deeper into the harbour, on the next slide you'll see, um, well, sorry, this slide, the, the first slide they just saw was the outer entrance, but if you go deeper into the harbour, 
you can go right up before you get to the bridge to an anchorage outside the the um, slip yard at, at North Sands, and you'll always see three or four or five or six boats on anchor there, um, where the um, anchorage by channel is there. You need to stay reasonably close to the, the green um, starboard hand mark because it does shoal up. But uh, from there, if you just want to avoid going to the town basin, you can just hop up in 20 minutes, half an hour to the town basin to do your shopping. Su supermarket there, it's right next to, um, to the pack and save and, uh, and all of the town, all of the facilities town, town shows. Next slide shows a picture of, um, that's, this is taken from being on anchor in the channel. And the next slide will show the swing bridge which you can go through. Um, just under the swing bridge, you might make out uh, there's a jetty. The idea is if you do want to go through to the town basin in your, in your vessel with masts, then you need to tie up to that jetty and the information's there for radioing through to have the, the bridge lifted. And it gets lifted very regularly. But uh, before you go up, you do need to make sure that you've got a spot to go to in the town basin. Our tendency is if we do if we do intend to spend a bit of time there, just to anchor in the channel we showed you, and uh, and just take the dinghy up, it saves a lot of a lot of grief, and it's also cheap, or free, should we say? Right. If you want to go further north, there are a lot of spots you can hop at. The next one's Tutukaka. Now Tutukaka's got a a marina which is right up in the top right hand corner, where you can fuel up if you want to, just inside the breakwater. But our tendency is just to go to where the red arrow is just outside the mooring area, drop anchor for the night, very comfortable, a little bit of a swell might come in in the nor'east, but, um, but really you're totally secure as you can see there, it's, it's almost landlocked. Then if you, if you can, if you, oh, that's a picture looking across, most of the boats you see there are, are on anchor, it's looking across from one of the beaches. It's a, it's a very secure little spot. But if we go a bit further north, um, in a southerly conditions, Mimi Whangata, nice spot, or or just north of that, only two or three miles, Bangaruru, which is very, very good for northerlies. So you've got there a northerly and a southerly anchorage. There's a photograph in the next slide of Mimbangata. And, and as, you, as you can see, it's it's roadsteading, open roadsteading, but, but um, quite secure. And the next slide shows how you can go in Bangaruru. And it's, again, there's virtually no swell will come into this bay. It's a big open bay, about a mile across. Those two arrows show the anchorages that we tend to go to. And the next picture shows a boat in one of those anchorages to give you some idea. So it's quite landlocked. Right, if we go a bit further north, um, just before we get to Cape Brett, it's only two or three miles south of Cape Brett, there's Whangamumu, um, which is very, very worth popping into. It's historic. If you go right into it, it's a keyhole anchorage, so it's landlocked. And, um, and there's, there's a, um, a whaling station there, which makes it interesting. We've got two or three shots coming up of what it's like in there. Next picture. You can see there how it's basically a keyhole anchorage, quite a narrow entrance and quite a big opening. You could fit in 30, 40, 50 boats quite easily in that anchorage. Nice beach on the foreshore for the kids, and um, to the to the left, in the distance, slightly in the distance, is where the whaling station is. There's two more shots on this. Next, please. So, looking from the beach, as you can see, very narrow entrance. The next one will show the whaling station, which is well worth a visit. So, it's a nice little spot to call into before you enter into the Bay of Islands. Not usually too many boats in there. And, uh, and generally very little swell. The only thing to bear in mind about it is don't attempt to go in there in severe easterly conditions. And if you've got any sense, you won't be on that coast anywhere on that area in severe easterly conditions anyway. Right from there, you hop around Cape Brett. Um, we put in Oki Bay there, which is a good launching off point or good coming in point. We've left from there in the early hours of the morning. We've come into there in the dark. It's, it's quite a big anchorage, and um, there's some quite nice walks from there too. There's a picture of it in the next 
shop. Yeah, so again, you could put 20, 30 boats in there quite easily with plenty of swinging room. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's a well-recognized and, and um, pretty much bulletproof anchorage, except from the, north, from the east. But from there, we move on to the, the main islands, which is really the main cruising area of the Bay of Islands. There's um, really, there's five islands in there which are worth anchoring off. One of them is privately owned, the middle one, but the other five are all, are all um, are excellent actually and very popular. You'll tend to find quite a lot of boats there in the summer. Uh, the worst month, worst time of year to go in there really is between Christmas and uh, middle of January because you may have up to 50 boats in any anchorage. But uh, I think you'll find that if you do go up to the Bay of Olives, there will be a lot less boats than you, that you have around Auckland. So if we look at Urupukapuka, which is on the next slide, it's the largest of these anchorages. Um, Paradise Bay, the side on the left, is one of the popular ones. And the next slide will show a bit more detail. Right, so there's a lot to do on these islands. Um, Urupukapuka and Motorua have got, each one has got about five anchorages, nice beaches, secure in different wind conditions. And between the islands to the north of Arapukapuka in uh, Wawaitoria and o Okahu, there are, again, nice little anchorages in those guts. Um, currents run through them, and uh, you do have to watch out for them in, in, in northeasterly conditions, but they're also nice spots. And for those who have finally made it up to the Bay of Islands and want to have a coffee, there's a bar and cafe in that bottom corner in Arapukapuka. Um, there's three campsites there too. They're all dock camps, uh, lovely spots. Picture of one in the next next slide. That's um, Cable Bay, which is one of the three dock camps. The only thing to watch out for this is to watch for the cable. It's a big white triangle which matches with the other side. It's the power cable that goes on. But uh, as long as you're clear of that, so it's a, it's a very comfortable anchorage. And there's two or three more slides which we can put through fairly quickly. Um, this was actually shot quite recently. Um, the, uh, it can get quite a few more boats in here, but there's always plenty of room in both of these ones. These are the two anchorages on the um, on the western side of the island. And as you can see, nice beaches, plenty of Putakawa. They're really, really pleasant and the kids will enjoy them. The other thing about Urupukapuka and Motorua are the walking tracks. Um, quite spectacular. This is a view looking down from one of them into one of the um, ravines. And there's an next one too from the top of Urupukapuka looking across. And in the far distance, you can see Russell and a little bit of Pai here. So what you're looking at there is looking towards Motorua and Robertson Island. There's a few boats in the main anchorage. Um, if you're walking around on the walking tracks, it can take five or six hours if you want to do the whole lot, but some of them are grassed, and you can see grass on the ridges there, and some are bush, and there are a lot of birds. Have been, bird species have been released there in recent times, quite rare, rare birds, so um, anybody who's a birdo would, would enjoy it, or anybody who just wants some exercise. All right, next slide. Um, Robertson Island, what are, what are here? I spelt wrong there. Um, it's uh, it's quite quite a uh, nice spelt it too. <laughs> quite a quite a popular anchorage, um, particularly in the southern corner in northerly conditions. We've got a couple of pictures of that. Next picture. Um, this, this is taken looking through one of the um, interpretive signs, which are well worth looking at. Um, at Tucker Thompson in the background there. So look, you can climb up to what was the old pass site and look down and we're looking from the anchorage on the right, right there and across towards Virupukapuka. Now the next slide will show a lagoon about halfway along the island. You can just see it behind the trees. And the next slide will show that lagoon, which is something that the kids will really enjoy. It's um, warm water, it's warmed up by the sun. And if you're snorkeling through there, you'll see um, all sorts of underwater signs. They've, they've been they've put these these interpretive 
signs telling you about the fish and the seaweed. So it's a little bit like being on a walking track. You can read all the information about the sea bottom as you're snorkeling along on the surface. So it's a, it's a really um, innovative sort of um, pastime. It's only any good at high tide, because at low tide it dries right out. But um, a lot of fun, well worth doing. Wow, John, that's pretty cool. Keep on. Tell us about that. Um, a lot of boats in bad weather will head into Manawara. Uh, there's three or four bay, or four or five bays in here, which are quite popular. The busiest we've ever seen it has been uh, at New Year's on one year where there were 100 boats in the main anchorage. But generally, generally there's so much room there that the boats will be well spread out. Um, pretty secure, not much swell comes in. Um, so I, I would call that really the, the inner Bay of Islands. The next slide shows the northern area, which is across towards Kerikeri. Much quieter there, not so many people will go there. Um, one of the points of interest is the, the Marsden Memorial, um, which is in one of the bays towards the top right of that circle, which has got the, where the first sermon was ever preached in the Bay of Islands. It was a big cross there. It was in 1814 by Samuel Marsden. If you go to the left in that picture, you, you can end up up at Kerry Kerry, but that's quite a, a, a channel, tidal channel, so you have to be care careful about that. A couple of pictures here taken from one of the very small islands you just saw. Um, with, uh, they're, um, they're actually quite secure, but there are reefs, so you do need to consult your charts before you do it. But uh, nice beaches and nice snorkeling and nice swimming. Another picture from the same same island. That particular island has four beaches on it. Then if you go into the inner Bay of Islands, where really, this is really where you'll go for reprovisioning. Uh, the next slide will show you the, the three points. You've got Pai here, down in the bottom, down, down on the left side, Opua right at the bottom corner there, and Russell on the top. Um, Pai. Yeah, um, so um, Pai here, uh, they're all well marked, well marked channels. Pai here's got uh, a couple of big supermarkets if you need to go in there or need to go to a bar or coffee. Uh, Russell's really picturesque. Uh, I've got a picture of the next one. You can get fuel there or water. That's Russell. No, good in a westerly. No, you just keep out of there in a westerly. It can get quite sloppy and a lot of moorings to tangle up with. And also, if we just go back one again. Oh, yeah, I have to back one more there. Opua, which is right down the towards the bottom corner of the channel. There's no shops there except a, a small general store, but you can get fuel there quite safely. And there's also a water berth you can pull, up, pull alongside the free at, um, at J Pier on the marina. So anybody can go there and, and water up, which is well worth knowing. And there's also um, fuel there, which is, um, which is four and a half to the current. So with the currents going out, it's on, it's on your nose as you go in and it's a stern if it's, it's coming in, but uh, fairly easy to maneuver onto. Um, there's also excellent anchoring there. It's quite a big mooring field, but plenty of places to anchor. And you can even hire cars in there too. So it's a, it's a good spot to go into in a bad blow, or if you need to pick up people, or if you even need to leave your boat, you can usually find a mooring. Right, we move on there. Through the oh yes, well there's a the dinghy dock at Opua. Um, if we if we go a bit further north, anybody who's been adventurous, you can call into the Cavallis, uh, put arrows to the two most common anchorages, or you can go even a bit further afield to Whangaroa, which is quite a gorgeous spot, a little bit further afield. There's a couple of pictures of the Cavallis in the next shot. That one and another. Well, it gives you, you an idea. You can easily get from the Bay of Islands to the Cavallis um, and anchor there the night and then head off and get to Whangaroa the next day. So you don't have to do an overnight trip for that um, that, that area. It's only Great. about three hours between each, really. Um, going into Whangaroa, I've just got the one shot really here, just inside the heads. Um, the arrows show two of the more popular um, anchorages. The one in the, the lower one of those is uh, fairly tight. You could only fit really usually about a dozen boats in there. 
Um, but uh, you can access it quite readily from the larger one. Um, one of the spectacular places to visit there is the Duke's Nose, which I've circled and show the track up to. Um, it's uh, quite a spectacular climb involving climbing a, a, a rope or what's now a, a bar to get to the very top. But from the top, there's an amazing view. Or if you, um, if, if you want to work the tide and you want to row up or paddle up in the kayak, you can go the, up the river, which is the bottom left corner, um, up right up to the head where there's a, a, a swimming pool, which, which is fresh water. Um, it's a spectacular trip to do, but only do it at high tide. And if you want to get, if you need to get water urgently and you can't get it at a pool, there is a, a watering buoy in the bottom right corner if you head, head in, um, which is available on a, on a platform with a hose where um, in the early part of summer, at least there's plenty of water. Later on in summer, it can dry out. There's a couple of pictures in Mangarai just to give you an idea of what it looks like. In the middle of there, there's the Duke's nose. And if you actually use your imagination, you can see him reclining with his, his hooked nose and his eye and his mouth right in the center. Um, it's a spectacular climb. And from the top is a spectacular view to the next picture. Yeah, so um, that's a, it's really a must do when you're, when you're up there. And uh, if you want to go up the river, you really, you only, only do it at high tide. You can walk up. Um, there's a walking track that takes you right through to Totra North, which is a lovely track, it takes about two hours. You can kayak up or, or row up the river quite a long way. And at the very end is the reward of a lovely freshwater pool you go into. So um, definitely worth doing, but it must be high tide. And you, low don't, tide. you don't want to get stuck with the tide going out. Then you have a long way to drag your dinghy over the mud and rocks, which is actually not very nice. Yeah. Now, um, the next picture just gives some information of the of, of where you can get information. Um, there's the, at the top, there's the Bay of Island Marina .co.nz has got most of those pink anchorages listed. Um, there's another, there's a, uh, if you go into their, into their website and then look for the top 25 places to anchor, there's a lot of good information about wind and holding. Um, the Royal Akarana Cruising Club Cruising Guide, it was, a, um, it was a great guide. It's been out for years and it's still really valuable. We use it a lot. And there's also under the, under the, um, the link www.nrc, which is Northern Regional Council dot government dot z nz um, and look up the schedule of cruising boat destinations there's more information than that too so they're they're um, really useful um, for, for pre-trip planning and um, yeah so anybody who wants to escape the rat race of Auckland and get north once the borders open um, I do recommend it that's about it from us yeah thanks very much John I mean that was really good I, I think the trip from Auckland to Bay of Islands That's might seem a bit daunting for some people because it's quite a long way. And knowing that you can stop, you don't have to do it in one jump. You can stop at all those places and they're all really cool places to go. I really enjoyed your, your talk and your explanation of, of what's in each one of those places and with the weather conditions oh, that those are good. Um, so thanks very much, John. I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I think. Yes, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so All good, John. Don't worry about it. Um, we'll, um, we'll, we'll probably wrap things up now. We're right on time. I did have a few more slides about um, uh, the Great Barrier, Waiheke, and Kauau. Um, but I think if we get into that now, we're going to be um, uh, quite late for finishing. Um, so I think we'll, we'll probably wrap up now. And um, I guess if we want to end with a, a Q&A session, you know, a few minutes, if people have got questions, we could um, uh, answer your questions happily. So if anyone's got a question, either just... Um, Use the chat function or just flick your microphone back on and, and ask away. Yeah. 
So I don't think there's any questions coming through. So thank you very much um, to all our guest speakers. Um, it, was, it was great to hear from um, PIC. Uh, thanks very much, Daniel, for that. And, and of course, Vicky for the uh, uh, island uh, cruising. I mean, I, I'm really interested in that as well. And, and, and of course, um, uh, John and Barbara for your um, experience of, of that eastern coast of, of the North Island going north up to up to the Bay of Islands. That's uh, certainly a trip I've got planned for, for Christmas, I think. I'll, I'll come and see you and I'll knock on, knock on your door now. I know what your boat looks like. Um, I think we've just got one question come in. Um, Oh, so that was just Andrea saying thanks to um, John and Barbara. Oh. Uh, hey there. Um, we have a question. Um, yeah. You, um, John and Barbara, you have done international expeditions, right? What's the longest distance you've traveled on one journey? So, um, John and Barbara, I don't know if you can hear the question come through. No. So it looks, I think John has, um, has got some technical issues. Um, if you've got any questions for, for John and Barbara, just email them through to me. I know Laurie um, put my email address in the chat. Um, but yeah, just, just flick me through the questions and I'll, I'll pass them on. Thanks very much for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been uh, really cool. I, I'm amazed the technology works so flawlessly. It was, I think this is the first zoom thing that i've done and there's not been any technical issues to speak of so i'm really pleased about that hope everyone enjoyed it and learned something and um yeah hopefully we'll get out of this horrible lockdown and and we'll get out sailing again real soon i don't know when that's going to be but i'm certainly looking forward to it um and i'd be great to see you in a bay somewhere cool and I look forward to having a beer with you. So um, take care, stay safe. And uh, yeah, let's get those vaccination numbers up and, and get out sailing and get, get through this horrible lockdown. But um, thanks for joining us. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in a bay somewhere. Okay, cheers guys. Thank you. Good night.